today's gospel, Jesus and his disciples are moving around on their way from Caesarea Philippi up and down the high mountain through the Galilee to Capernaum. They seem to do that a lot, don't they? Move around. And you know, Caesarea Philippi and Capernaum, by our standards, aren't so really far apart. I confirmed this when I visited the Holy Land in last May. But of course, it takes a lot longer to traverse that distance on foot, as Jesus did, instead of in an automobile or air-conditioned bus, as I did. And Jesus and the disciples seem to be almost constantly on the move, from there to the here to up this, down that, over there, moving, walking, traveling. And it's almost as if there is a message just in that, because so much of the conversation and so many of the important insights seem to come not when Jesus has arrived at a destination, but between one place and another. And as a liturgist, I want to connect all of Jesus' perambulations with the kinds of processions we have in our litur liturgy. The entrance as the people gather in prayer, the presentation of the gifts and offerings at the altar, and of course our own procession, our moving about, to come to God's holy table and receive communion. We tend to think of all those things in terms of their objective. You know, an entrance procession. It's a way for the liturgical ministers to enter. I mean, it's a fancy and ritualistic way, but it's a way. And it takes our focus from the world out there and leads us to the altar. And the offertory procession. Well, you can't pray over bread and wine unless you have bread and wine, right? So it has a very functional uh, purpose. But let me be clear, there's nothing wrong with thinking about our actions in terms of their ultimate objectives, their end, their goal. But sometimes, sometimes we spend a lot of energy getting to the goal, like Jesus on his way to Capernaum this morning. And we focus on that goal. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But sometimes we have a tendency to focus on that goal to the exclusion of nearly everything else. You probably recognize what I'm talking about, don't you? You've heard it at home, you know, don't bother me now, I'm, you know, uh, balancing the checkbook, making dinner, all those things, working on this project, playing this video game, or while driving. Let's just concentrate on finding our exit and after that, we can continue the conversation we are having. I say this every time I leave Newark Airport, because otherwise I wind up in the wrong destination. And much of the time, we never get back to the conversation that was so important. It just gets dropped and forgotten about. So often, a phrase like, let's wait till we're home to discuss that, results in an important and usually difficult topic just being ignored. And a lot of the time, when one of us says something that is challenging or confusing or incomprehensible, we would just as soon change the topic and talk about something easier, right? And all of that appears to be going on in this tiny, brief passage from Mark's Gospel this morning. They're walking about, apparently, for several days, not just the 40 minutes it might take us to traverse the distance. Jesus and his disciples are out on that hot road, walking and talking. And you can almost imagine them having to step off the road for an ox cart to pass, stopping here and there for a meal or a drink of water, having a brief afternoon nap under the shade of a big tree, trying to comfort the young one before her baptism, <laughs> meeting people, talking here and there, and all of this on their way to Capernaum. And somewhere in the midst of this, Jesus says, quote, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. Now, don't you just wish one of the disciples said, Huh? Or, you know, what are you talking about, Jesus? Or even the New York idiom, Get out of here. <laughs> I sure do. Mark tells us they did not understand and that they were embarrassed to ask him. Actually, he says they were afraid. Maybe they were afraid because they did understand. 
They understood enough to realize that they didn't want to talk about such a painful subject. They didn't want clarity because Jesus just might tell them that this Son of Man, the Son of Humanity, and that's a title for the Messiah for the book of Daniel, by the way, and as good Jews, they would have been knowledgeable about the Scripture and understood exactly what he meant by this. They were afraid that Jesus might tell them that he was the Son of Man. So they settle back into other conversations, postponing this difficult one until they get to the destination. And when they get there, Jesus asks them, what were you talking about on the way? Now, of course, they are totally embarrassed because all they have to report is that they had this meaningless, pointless conversation about who is more important than whom. Meaningless and pointless because for some time, Jesus has been telling them and showing them in ways that are sometimes subtle and sometimes bluntly obvious that everyone is beloved and treasured by God and equal in God's sight. And what Jesus tells them, it sounds almost as if he wants to say something like, you know, get over this first and last bit, you silly fools. It's not for me or for you to decide who sits at my right hand or my left. Here am I, the very Son of God, that Son of humanity you have been longing for, the Messiah, and I am your servant, here to serve your needs, and you will kill me for that. We can imagine a bit of Jesus' anger in that statement he makes, even without my open-minded and somewhat risky extrapolation from the scripture. The gist of it is that Jesus is reminding the disciples that they do not understand. You don't get it, he says. And so he tries again. And he takes a child in his arms. A child. Sometimes we see children as the symbol of helplessness or purity or simplicity. But here, here I suggest the child can also be the icon of unguarded honesty. Those of you who are parents will definitely know what I mean, and the rest of us have probably experienced it too. Children are honest and unguarded, and they ask all those amazing and frustrating and interminable questions. Why? How much longer? What does that sign say? What does that mean? What's that man doing? Where are we going? A what? And you know what else? For children, for children, the journey is a really big part of the experience, isn't it? Children on a trip do not sit quietly for hours on end until they reach their destination, do they? When I was a kid, we used to go to the back of the station wagon and hit each other. <laughs> if they want to play games, read stories, and ask questions. And they know just as clearly as most of us adults have forgotten how important each moment of life is. For a child, getting from here to there is not just about arriving, it's also about leaving, and it's mostly about going, about moving about, about traveling. And maybe this is part of what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, and how the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church today. Be like a child. And let the traveling, the journey, the getting there be as much a part of life as the destination. Be like a child and have the reckless courage to say, I don't know what you're talking about, and I'd sure like to understand. Be like a child and let your unguarded honesty show from time to time. Because all of life is a journey, after all, a really big and hopefully long journey, but a journey. And thinking of life as a journey can be especially helpful in times of trouble. Right now, you know, we're just lost in some godforsaken wilderness. But someday, someday, this will be a distant memory. If you know it's a journey, you know we'll get through it. After all, even Jesus encountered some bumps in the road. As one writer put it, the cross of Christ was not a tragic interruption of an otherwise profound and beautiful life. Rather, Jesus is alive after the cross. 
Jesus' life includes, doesn't preclude, but includes the cross. And if he can suffer that, maybe, just maybe, we can live with what is given us. And thinking of life as a journey can be helpful also in times of joy. This is great, this is wonderful, but you know what? It's not going to last. Not forever, not without some conflict or sadness. That's just reality. The larger undertaking is about a destination, sure, and that destination for all of us is union with God. It is paradise. It is a glorious resurrection for each and every one of us. But until then, the journey continues. When we think of life as a journey, all of these little perambulations we make are just what symbols of the larger undertaking in our liturgy as well. Imagine the entrance is not just a few folks in fancy clothes walking up to the altar, but all of us, all of us, on a journey to holiness. See, the offering procession, not just as that stuff that's back there that needs to get up here, but your every hope and fear, dream and desire, pain and loss, being placed on this altar and offered up to God. Imagine us at the end, walking out of here, commanded, commissioned, and empowered to go out into the world to seek and serve the risen Christ, to help make the world a better place, to continue the journey. And then let yourself come forward to receive the precious body and blood of our Savior at this altar. Let yourself become like a child, not only relishing every moment in the journey, but using every moment to open your heart to the love of God.